Good morning, poultry fans, and we have another great show for you today. Joining me is Jeff Maddox. Everybody uh, seemed to really enjoy your last program with us, Jeff, and we're eagerly waiting to to have you back on, and we're very blessed to have you willing to, to join us. So welcome to the show, Jeff. Hey, thanks for inviting me, Rip. I enjoyed it last time, and I'm sure we'll have a good time this time as well. So, Very good. Jeff's going to be sharing with us a little bit today about illnesses and the role that nutrition may or may not play in some of those illnesses. I got to admit, and I was just telling Jeff before we I started recording this, that the first time I had heard him speak on this, it literally blew me away. So this is something you're going to want to take notes on. So Jeff, what are some of the more common illnesses that our viewers are more likely to encounter that may have a nutritional relationship? Uh, most of the illnesses or diseases that we have out there are coming out of the environment. So you know, protecting yourself from those are going to be more keeping that immune system functioning at a very high level. Um, a lot of that is going to be coming from the right vitamin levels, primarily vitamin E and selenium. Uh, zinc will also play a pretty significant role in, in supporting that immune system and keeping the birds as healthy as possible. Look, if, if they're already as healthy as they can be, right, they're they're going to be able to fight off when they're exposed to certain illnesses, they're going to be able to fight it off more naturally and they're going to get through it, build their own immunities to it. Often when I see somebody who contacts me with a catastrophic, you know, illness, um, you know, as I dig a little deeper, they tend to be feeding feeds that are, are on the lesser expensive side. Mm -hmm. uh, trying to keep their bills down, you know, they probably have a few more chickens than they actually need, but they can't bring themselves to part with them. So then the feed bill gets out of hand. They start looking for that layer feed or something like that. And they don't realize that this is like a spiral downward, um, you know, heading you off, heading you to less protection for your birds. So, and I, I got to admit, you know, for a very, very long time, I was right there with them, uh, cheapest for me, but, uh, it took me a while to learn the lesson, but it was a very valuable lesson. Once I finally figured it out that I was only shooting myself in my own foot by doing that. Yep. Yep. Amen to that. Cause, uh, if we can, you know, if people would just cut back or call birds back to a manageable level, keep the best that they have and then feed them better. Uh, the economics work out to be the same in the end, but it, it, people just have a hard time parting with chickens. Um, you know, they, they, they love them. They want to keep them. And so, uh, I, you know, really keeping the vitamin levels and the proper nutrition up is going to be your best defense as far as any illness goes. You know, as I'm talking to people and I'm sure you're the same, um, the things that pop up most often are things like coccidiosis which is often misdiagnosed and it's actually necrotic enteritis. Right. Um, cause it's hard to tell the difference just by physical symptoms. Um, you know, the manure may look the same, the bird activity level may be the same, you know, and watching some of the Facebook posts out there, it's like somebody shows a sick chicken and everybody either wants to give it cord cause they think it's coccidiosis. Everything's cox. Every problem with a chicken goes back to coccidiosis or they want to give it ivermectin and they want to worm it. Right. And, um, you know, both are environmental. Um, so people can be their own worst or best friend and <laughs> by keeping the environment cleaned up and, and don't be feeding birds off the ground and discourage them from eating spilled grains off the ground. You know, they're designed to scratch and peck something off the ground, but we don't really want it to be their feed. Okay. Find something else that you can, you know, that they can chase after, um, <clears throat> besides those. So, you know, that environment, again, it's not necessarily nutritional, but if the bird's immune system is functioning at a high level, it won't be as affected, right? It's going to have a couple of days of feeling off and it's going to get right back with the program and move ahead. And it's when 
you know, necrotic enteritis or coccidiosis wins the battle. So preventing those, nutritionally speaking, um, making sure that you're feeding a good probiotic, okay, periodically, not every day, okay, just once or twice a week, you know, find a probiotic. I don't care if you go get plain yogurt at the grocery store, okay, just put a couple dollops on top of their feed, make it available to them, reseed the gut continually with beneficial bacteria. This gives us beneficial exclusion is the term we use. So the more, there's only so many sites in the digestive tract for bacteria to connect to the intestinal wall or the gut wall. And the more of those we fill up with beneficial bacteria, the less chance of coccidiosis or necrotic enteritis to be able to attach to that intestinal wall and cause severe illness. Because both of those are going to feed on the intestinal wall, right? They're going to chew away at the villi, um, on that, on that gut wall, kind of like an ulcer going to erode away. So anyway, let's back up, uh, probiotics going to be your number one, right? So mm -hmm. as a preventative feeding probiotics is, you know, you're going to be really happy with doing that. And, you know, I can treat a hundred birds with one pint of plain yogurt. I mean, that's how far that stretches. Well, wow. so you're not looking at a huge investment by any means, right? You can go get a quart of plain Greek yogurt, any yogurt, doesn't matter, plain yogurt. Um, and a quart's gonna, gonna treat up to 200 birds. And yeah, for, a, for 298 or whatever the cost of that yogurt is, you know, you just, you did a great thing. Even if you only did it once a week, that's gonna be beneficial. The simple sugars in the yogurt that come naturally from the milk are also going to feed the beneficial bacteria already residing in the gut. Okay. Not feeding the necrotic enteritis, not feeding the coccidiosis oocyst, but feeding the positive, you know, lactobacillus type bacteria, um, and just feeding the gut in general. So <clears throat> people get all excited, you know, if they have a little bit of coccidiosis, a little bit of coccidiosis is completely normal in a chicken's digestive tract. People don't understand that if you sent me a manure sample and I did a fecal float on it and I saw zero oocyst, that bird's probably on the verge of dying, okay? Because it does not have a healthy gut. So zero is not the right answer. Same thing for parasites, okay? If I did that same fecal float and I'm looking for parasite eggs, I want to see 40 to 60 parasite eggs per gram of manure. That sounds like a lot and it's not. Okay. So until you get well over a hundred egg count, uh, fecal egg count per gram, we don't really have anything to worry about. The birds are fine. Okay. Just don't, zero is not the right number. Small amounts are part of the ecosystem of that chicken's digestive tract. Anyway, for treating parasites, if they're actually, go ahead. Did you have something? No, I was just going to say, Okay, and I'm assuming you can start this at a very early age with, with chick right on up through, uh, adulthood. Oh yeah. Is that yeah, I like to, um, the first tw 48 hours, first few to three days, I want them pretty much chicks to only get on feed. So they, they don't, they know exactly what feed is. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, uh, usually at the end, you know, in the afternoon of day three, we can start with some type of a plain milk product. I don't care if it's whole milk, yogurt, whatever, you know, whatever they choose is fine. Yogurt's easy to use. Um, whole milk is also fairly easy to use. Uh, both will have the exact same effect on the digestive tract of that chicken. So, um, start at day three. I like to do it again about day seven and I'll do it again at day 14. The timing for this is as a preventative for coccidiosis. Notice I said day three, not every day, day three, day seven, day 14. Okay. I'm about a week apart and I'm seeding the gut, you know, I'm helping the gut seed itself with, with positive or beneficial bacteria, which takes away a space for coccidia to attach, form and, and grow. So. That works really good. I've got several larger growers, you know, on that protocol, you know, they're doing the day three, seven and 14. Mm -hmm. Um, most of our birds, if I can get them past a 21, 21 and 28 in there, um, 
they'll have enough immunity to coccidiosis that we don't really have to worry about it ever again in that bird's life. Okay. But it's it, unless something in the environment goes completely haywire, um, that bird will have its own, you know, natural biosystem and the coccidiosis should not be a problem. Now, if I go in and treat a bird, I just, I just had an incidence of this. Someone contacted me, horrible coccidiosis, losing birds. And, but the birds were started on a medicated starter. Those medications that amprolium or that cord in that feed will not allow that bird to develop its own natural immunities to coccidiosis, right? It's going to inhibit, it's going to retard or slow down that, that immune system, um, for development. And I know a lot of people like to use medicated feeds because that's what the feed store tells them, or that's what their friends all use or whatever the reason is. Mm -hmm. Um, but in a good, fairly clean environment, um, with low exposure to coccidiosis, those birds will actually be able to thrive and be healthier in the long run. So we can, you know, this is way off topic of what you asked me to come on for, but you know, use it, okay. using medicated feeds actually is going to probably more than likely affect our overall reproductive performance as the adult bird. Okay. It's really, it's gonna, yeah, it's going to get into the system. You're probably, it's a negligible amount, right? I mean, we might be talking about 5% difference in hatchability, but if you're working with a really hard to, to fertilize type, you know, if you're working with a breed that's hard to copulate and, and fertilize naturally, mm -hmm. you know, 5% can be huge for you, right? If you're, you know, some of those really heavy breeds that have a hard time mating, you know, naturally, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, we're just kind of putting ourselves back, you know, one more step or behind that curve. Um, it, so those amproliums early on are going to interfere with proper development of other body systems. And the longer you feed it, you know, the more, the, the more it's going to delay everything else in that chicken's life. So, you know, try not to do it any longer than you have to. I mean, I, you can get the same effects out of using copper sulfate in the water as using amproleum in the feed. You know, one tablespoon um, of copper sulfate, blue crystal powder in five gallons of drinking water. Um, you can run it periodically for three days. And you're going to get the exact same effects as though you were feeding a medicated feed or putting cord in the water, you know, it works fine. And I don't like to do anything prophylactically or just as a prevent, you know, just when it comes to something like copper sulfate or cord, you know, use them as designed, you know, for short burst, short periods. It only takes two to three days to get things back to normal if we fix the environment and got things under control. So copper sulfate to me is a whole lot more natural, um, you know, and it's easy to get, doesn't require any kind of drug license, even though Amprol doesn't either. It should, um, uh, anybody can walk into tractor supply and buy a gallon of cord anytime they want. And they have no idea the long-term effects, you know, that that's having on our environment, their bird, everything. I mean, we're killing earthworms and, and things in the soil because of overuse and in, improper use. Jeff, where could uh, a poultry keeper find copper sulfate? Can they get that at the feed store, at the drug store? Garden center. Uh, garden garden centers, centers almost always keep little five pound bags of copper sulfate. Um, just read the label good, make sure that it only contains copper sulfate, that they didn't put any an agent or anything else in there. Um, better feed stores that actually manufacture their own feed. Um, should have some copper sulfate as well. Um, you know, if people can't find it, they're welcome to reach out to me for a while. We were packaging, you know, one or two pound bags for people just to keep, you know, in their medicine cabinet as mm -hmm. a break glass in case, case of emergency kind of thing. And, you know, we'll figure it out. It's not that hard to find. Uh, people seem to get overwhelmed when they're looking for copper sulfate. I think they're overthinking it. Like I said, any good garden center. I can go buy copper sulfate, blue crystal powder, dissolves in water, you know, and usually I'll make a stock mix in the house <laughs> uh, with warm water. 
So mm -hmm. I'll take my tablespoon and put it in a quart or a half gallon container. I'll mix that with hot water just to make sure I get a thorough dissolve. Mm -hmm. And then I'll take that out and put it in the five gallon bucket and then fill it up with cool water or cold water right out of the hose or however the water's being filled. Um, that way I know I got a really good uh, dissolving and copper sulfate doesn't like to dissolve as well in cold water. So depending on where you live and what your well water temperature is, you know, for us, well water comes out at between 55 and 60 degrees. Now you're down in Florida, your well water is a little warmer than mine. Um, it's a lot warmer than yeah. that. So you, you, yeah. So you would be fine dissolving yours directly, but, um, if your water temperature is much below 70 degrees, I think you're better off to dissolve it with hot water just to be safe. And then, yeah, just to administer it. I, I tell folks three days on, uh, no, never more than three days because copper will load up in the soft tissues, you know, and we can get some long-term negative effects. I, it's doubtful that we will, but it is a potential, you know, and I don't want people calling me and, and saying, Hey, you killed my bird. Come to find out they fed copper sulfate for six months straight. And mm. you know, it's like, so it, it can, copper can be toxic and. Let's shift gears here for just a okay. minute. What about amino acid? Is there anything we can do or should be concerned about when our amino acids in our feeds are not balanced right? Um, the, so for show birds, amino acids are, are really huge. I mean, you guys, the show community or the poultry community that has fancy fowl, you know, they're looking for the better feathers right? They want better mm -hmm. feather development. And that's what they're going to see from better amino acids, primarily methionine. That's, that's harder to get than the lysine. Lysine is fairly easy to achieve the numbers, uh, cause it's a, it's coming out of grain type proteins, which is in most of our feeds. The methionine doesn't come out of grain protein very well, but doesn't show up very well in grain protein. So having a meat type protein, but methionine is responsible for immune system development, internal organs, and all those systems, how they, how they develop at those early ages. So from week, from day one till 16 weeks, uh, having that appropriate methionine level, and I would say everybody needs to be above 0.45%, um, during that time, 0.5 is even better. And if you've got some if your fowl has an ex, you know, a huge amount of plumage, like you got a really heavy plumage bird, um, I would be running at 0.53 on methine. Now that's free, you know, for, as a poultry fancier, you'd almost be out there putting it on with a salt shaker. Okay. It, it's, if you bought pure methionine, you know, it's hard for you to add that to, directly to a feed and supplement it. So most of the time I tell folks to use fish meal, um, and fish meal will bring that methionine level up and all the amino acid levels up, um, and you know, as little as a teaspoonful a day of fish meal can make a huge difference. Again, that depends on the size and weight of the bird, mm -hmm. the smaller medium sized birds in that four to six pound teaspoons good. Um, heavier birds, heavy plumage, you know, up in that 10 pound range or higher, I could be doing two, ta two teaspoons a day of fish meal. Birds like it. They like the smell of it. It's a meat protein. They usually go right after it. So it's not usually a problem to get them to clean it up. Um, <clears throat> poultry folks aren't real happy because it's powder and it falls to the bottom. So you're going to want to figure out a way to help it stick to, you know, the other grains that you're mixing or that you're feeding. So it stays kind of in suspension, so to speak. And, mm -hmm. um, uh, fish meal and other meat type proteins, you know, they, they're going to bring a lot of those missing amino acids. And, uh, they also, I mean, a good fish meal runs around 10% fat. So you're going to be picking up the omega threes that your, your bird needs that it's not getting anywhere else. You're going to have better liver function. You're going to have better cholesterol depositing, uh, you know, the, the benefits kind of go on and on, but what they're going to see the most is, um, way better, uh, feather formation. You know, 
the feathers are just going to structure, you know, at, at a higher level. And you, you can overdo it. I mean, beyond that level that I talked about earlier, you're just kind of wasting the methionine. It's just going to end up manuring out the back end. Um, <clears throat> so if you're feeding the fish meal and, and you want to know if you have too much or don't have too much is, uh, well, if you taste it in the eggs, you probably have too much and back it down a little bit. But the other thing is, it is undigested or unabsorbed protein is going to come out uh, as an ammonia smell. So you're going to have a, a much higher ammonia smell, you know, in, in the chicken house or wherever you're keeping your birds. Mm -hmm. So you may need to adjust it that way. You know, people are also welcome to contact me and I get back to them as much as I can. <laughs> and uh, I can try and help them balance it out, you know, and figure out the right level based on their birds. Because a bantam's not going to even need a full teaspoon. A half a teaspoon for a bantam type breed, just because of their body weight, is going to be plenty. And that's a pretty good rule of thumb you know, based on their body weight, uh, because of how much feed they intake, you know, and how many, you know, how much feather we have to, do, to deposit. What about, um, vitamins and minerals? Yeah. What do we need I was, to uh, go there to keep our birds healthy? Yep. I mean, I, I kind of made a little bit of a cheat sheet after you and I talked and, um, so there's no sites out there that give you really great nutritional requirements for breeders. Right? So, you know, it took me a while to figure it out. It took me a while to figure it out and go find something. And Hubbard, if, if you do a search on Hubbard breeders or Hubbard poultry, mm -hmm. they probably have, and their technical library will, will lead you down the right road, but they're calling for 65 to 7,000 international units of vitamin A per pound of feed. Right. And, uh, uh, vitamin D in that 2000 to 2500 range, vitamin E at around a hundred international units per pound. So those are just some of them, but they give you a full list of the different vitamins you need out there. Now, this is not, these types of feed still are not off the shelf ready or available for breeding folks, for folks who have fancy fowl. Okay. It, it's. It really saddens me that, you know, somebody is not paying attention to it and they may have been paying attention to it. I, I see a couple of companies starting to think about it. Um, Kalmbach out of Ohio has put together, you know, a breeder, a, a higher breeder feed still doesn't hit those levels I just talked about, but at least they're making the attempt. Um, I think where it's failed in the past is it has a hard time hitting any market saturation. So when people see 25 or $26 a bag for feed, they're like, no way I'm going down to tractor supply and buy my, you know, 16% layer feed. And they don't understand what they're missing. Right? They, they, until they try it. Okay. Um, yeah. they'll never see the difference until they actually try it. And, and you can also, you know, you can purchase supplements to compensate for these and add it to existing feeds, which, you know, is something that you and I know that I've come out with. Mm -hmm. Um, it's one way to do it. It's at about three cents per bird per day. You know, when I say it that way, it's not as scary, but when somebody calls to order a bag, they're like, holy crap, you know, that's expensive. But so, well, but, uh, I, I can tell you from experience and, and since I started using it with my birds, I have noticed a huge difference not only in the way the bird's plumage looks, but also in the way the bird's bodies feel in my hand. And also, uh, I see a difference in activities and, and, uh, they just seem to be much calmer. You know, I've, I've got barred rocks and, and golly, those things I thought were pretty calm. And, and these, now that I've got them on this, your supplement, golly, they're, they're underfoot. I'm tripping and falling over them, afraid I'm going to squish them. But they just got real chummy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. If their nutritional needs are being met, that's exactly what you want. I mean, they should be, depending on the breed, um, you know, they're going to be really calm, laid back, not too excited about anything. Um, that's a good sign. That That's really a good sign. And uh, I'm glad you're seeing that. And 
And the thing that really shocked me, to be honest with you, is it didn't take very long before I started seeing a change in their attitudes and, and, and that sort of thing. Like I said, they were much calmer. The other changes have been a little bit slower in coming about, but that, you know, with plumage and these, some of these are young birds and, uh, you got to wait till they molt those newer feathers in and, but mm -hmm. it, it definitely makes a difference and, and I would highly recommend it. Yeah. Right after the molt is when most people are seeing the biggest difference. So if they start, you know, just before the molt, while the bird's going through the molt, um, coming out of the molt, they see, they notice the plumage part of it way better. Um, over about a month to two months time, they'll notice less internal fat, more body density. So they'll, the bird will just, you know, they'll get that denser, harder, yes. just more solid feel. Um, it, that's not going to happen overnight, <clears throat> but the attitude change or the personality change we see usually within seven to 10 days, you know, you just notice a big difference in their whole demeanor. And so, uh, yeah, um, that's, uh, I just wish, you know, more people, if they're not going to spend the money on the better feeds that are out there, then they, they need to figure out a way to supplement, you know, the vitamins, the, the amino acids, which is coming from the fish meal or other amino acids. <clears throat> They're going to see a huge difference. And down the road, increasing those vitamins, like I was talking about Hubbard, you know, and those, and those vitamin levels. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And they, uh, <clears throat> those vitamins, particularly A and E, are critical for fertility and hatchability, but also it goes all the way through to the chick and that chick vigor, you know? So when it pips out, you know, just getting a chick that's ready to, to meet the world, you know, get the I, And I'm just eagerly awaiting of being able to start setting again, because I'm, I know with as much difference as I'm seeing in my birds now, that that's going to transmit down the line, uh, to things that better, stronger chicks, better hatchability, better livability. And, and, and uh, I'm just excited about it. Yep. Yeah. Uh, you know, breeding performance can definitely go back to, you know, nutritional aspects. Um, they always bump up the selenium levels for breeder flocks. They always keep the vitamin A and E levels higher than usual. The D actually still helps, but the D is also helping to get the right calcium deposit. So you get mm -hmm. the right eggshell formation. Um, everything kind of ties together with everything else. And, uh, you know, folks get weaker shells and they think they just add more calcium. That's not the right answer. You know, uh, chances are. So calcium is the cheapest part of a chicken feed. That calcium number you see on a chicken feed is, is the cheapest ingredient in that entire bag. So if more calcium was the right answer, more people would be, you know, putting in higher levels. Chances are something else is off, right? Is the vitamin D off? Is the phosphorus level off? Phosphorus is more expensive. Vitamin D is more expensive. So they're going to run those at those minimum levels. To just barely get by to help keep their price down because they know the shopper coming in is gonna first thing you're gonna look at is price per per bag right and they're they're not comparing labels they're not reading ingredients they're not you know so <clears throat> sometimes we're we're own we're our own worst enemies in in that aspect and but some of the nutritional related illnesses that folks could see um have you seen curly toe Rip, ever seen yes. curly toe? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that, that is a riboflavin deficiency. Okay. And I see that often get misdiagnosed as Marix or something else, but curly toe in a chick that shows up between day five and day seven, um, you know, is a riboflavin deficiency, part of the B vitamin spectrum, um, spraddle leg where it looks like you kind of broke their leg right out to the side. Mm -hmm. That's a manganese deficiency. Um, now if it's one out of a hundred, no, it's not. If it's 10 out of a hundred, yeah, then you have a manganese deficiency. Same way with the curly toe. Um, this past couple of years, I've heard more rickets showing up, which is a calcium vitamin D deficiency in those baby chicks. And this is where that milk really plays into it or dairy product, because you're going to mm -hmm. get a very simplified calcium and vitamin D 
out of those dairy products. So milk at that three, day three, day seven, day 14 time frame, and you can even continue to day 21 if you want. You can do it once a week for the rest of their life. It doesn't matter, but um, dairy products are going to help a lot with, with rickets. Um, and I can't, it, it went for a long time without seeing rickets. You know, I probably went seven or eight years without a diagnosed case of rickets. And then this past two years, you know, I have diagnosed at least a half a dozen, which is unusual. I mean, that's, mm. yeah, <laughs> I don't, I, I don't really see that very off, often. Um, you know, lethargic birds, you know, whether it's chick or chicken myopathy, where they kind of get you know, lose some function or muscle function and things like that. Um, that's back to that vitamin E and selenium. Uh, look, I don't want everybody to go out and buy vitamin E and selenium and, and start dosing it to their birds. Both of those can be toxic. There's a science behind how they should be properly, you know, fed and administered. And more doesn't always mean better, but having the right levels is important. So they should talk to somebody, you know, who has really good experience and understands those functions and, uh, make sure that they have the right levels. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, most of the time I find that just adding vitamin E works because selenium is not very expensive either. It's not an expensive ingredient in feed, but the vitamin E is a very expensive. So if we can figure out a way to just supplement a little bit of extra vitamin E. So to properly absorb selenium. We have to have the right level of vitamin E. The two work synergistically together in the body. Like I can put a whole 50 pound bag of selenium in a chicken coop and let them have at it. And it's not going to do anything but make sick chickens. Um, so if I don't have the vitamin E to facilitate proper absorption and utilization within the body system, those two work hand in hand. So same vice versa. Too much vitamin E gets toxic. You know, if I don't have enough selenium to kind of buffer it and, and work it, you know, correctly. Um, yeah. I've never seen it, but iron and copper deficiencies are going to show up as, so people with heavy cover or high color levels in their birds, especially if you've got a bunch of blacks and you got a bunch of rust colors or reds in there, mm -hmm. um, hey. copper and iron are going to are going to show up in those feathers, you know, or, or not going to show up in those feathers and the feathers just aren't going to have the right depth of color, but they'll also lead to anemia. And again, I don't see this very often and neither of those are very expensive, but there are some backyard mixes that I've ran into where people don't understand the importance of those and, uh, it'll make a big difference. Um, go ahead. I was just going to say, talk for a minute, uh, and I can't remember exactly where I heard you say this, but the role of B vitamin and the effect that it has on a flock's demeanor. So B vitamins as a whole, you know, all the B vitamins are what we refer to as our calming vitamins, um, or they're your stress management. That's a better way to say it because when you or I, or any creature, um, is under a heavy stress load, the B vitamins burn off very rapidly. Now B vitamins are normally stored in the liver or the brain, mostly in the liver. Um, and, but they're the vitamins that enable us to manage stress better. Okay. So, you know, some major stress comes along. You know, those B vitamins are also critical to be deposited in the yolk for the chick, you know, for hatchability, you know, getting that chick off the ground. Those B vitamins are critical for that. Um, but that's also a stressful event. You know, coming into that shell is not an easy task. We just kind of, you know, look at it and, and wonder how that happens. But it's, uh, <clears throat> your B vitamins are going to be your stress vitamins. You know, and they're also going to be key to reproductive performance. And mm -hmm. yeah, B vitamins are expensive. And, you know, I mean, so again, they, they tend to, in a commercial type feed, they tend to keep those at lower levels, you know, to help hold the cost down. So the bargain buyer, 
um, you know, we'll buy their feed over the next guy's feed. And, uh, in a breeder situation, you know, that's definitely the wrong way to go. You know, trying to get the, every chick he can get to hatch is, is your future. I can't help, but wonder what role, uh, B vitamins might play in some of our flightier breeds like Legerns, Menorcas, and calls the Mediterranean birds, uh, who, who tend to be naturally flighty by nature. Um, and, and I'm, I'm wondering if those folks that are raising those breeds, uh, might give that a shot. And if they just want to run a cheap experiment, there's a liquid B vitamin complex called, uh, total B, um, liquid. And it's a sublingual made for humans that can go underneath your tongue. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. and it, but it's, it's a, you know, it's a blend of B vitamins specifically for, for boosting that. And one milliliter, which is one dropper full comes with a dropper. Mm -hmm. So you can take it one dropper full is one milliliter. So one milliliter is good for about a gallon of chick water, you know, and they should run it. They should, you know, have a control group, get some of this, uh, total B sublingual, you know, put a few drops in their water bowl, you know, just, you know, have a half a dozen birds that you're running the test with, you know, put a few drops in each water bowl every day and watch the demeanor change. Okay. Watch, you know, watch that if they're keeping them, you know, penned up individual or, you know, mating, um, some people don't always see the difference when it's a whole group, when it's a whole flock setting, mm -hmm. not everybody sees the difference because it can be very gradual. You know, it's, it's a gradual change and things that, you know, change gradually are not as obvious to some people. Um, otherwise they'd have to take a before and after video We're on it for about, it's going to take 10 days probably to notice a significant difference. But if you had one individual, you know, hyper bird, you know, if you're, and you're keeping them in tens, I think you could see that, you know, pretty quickly, just calm them right down. Very interesting. And so folks, if you, if you breed one of these flightier breeds or, or you have a few birds that are flighty, get yourself some B vitamin supplement and see what you can do for your bird. Maybe just a very simple solution. Yeah. And inexpensive as well. That, that total B sublingual is under 10 bucks a bottle, you know, it comes in a little one ounce fluid bottle. Um, it's going to last you quite a while. It's going to let you know whether or not your feed has the right levels of B vitamins already in it, right? If they respond to it and you're missing something, if they don't respond to it, then there it's going to be, then you have probably have a half decent feed and there's no need to, you know, go yell at your feed guy and tell him you need more B vitamins. <laughs> Well, Jeff, I know you're a busy guy. I don't want to keep you too long because I, I know you got a lot of irons in the fire today. And all those farmers, since it's raining, are going to be giving you calls and just burning up the rest of your day for you. Yep. But I want to say just thank you so much for taking the time to, to spend with us. And golly, every, every time I hear you talk, there's something, a little bell goes off up here. You know, I need to remember that I got, I got to. Uh, I got to try that because it, it has been a very enlightening, um, experience just to, to hear you speak. And it's, it's, I, I know I'm not the only one to get something out of it because we've got a lot of viewers out there that get a lot of it, uh, out of it as well, because I hear from them on a regular basis. Uh, so thank you very, very much. Thanks for having me. Mm -hmm.